cool. All right, let me just move the keyboard across. I'll sit on that side of it. Can you still see over there, Aiden? Cool. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna do a little bit on um, sort of network security stuff. There's some more uh, advanced level stuff in here, but uh, generally it's, you know, I'll try and keep it as abstract as possible. Little overview of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, just typical network security. Um, what are the challenges? What are the countermeasures? An IDS, can anyone tell me what an IDS stands for? It stands for intrusion detection system, correct. Firewalls and uh, vulnerability management. So, um, is it enough to have things like encryption, hashes, digital signatures, access control for, um, for, for data and communication? Well, there are potential attacks um, on unexpected weaknesses and um, on security mechanisms that we have to consider. Uh, procedures used to provide services are often counterintuitive and become more obvious once the threats are considered. And um, design of a security mechanism should be followed uh, by the consideration as where these should be used uh, physically and network and um, within the TCIP layers. So, countermeasure, what is a countermeasure? Any means to deal with a security attack and uh, they can be used to prevent attacks from succeeding, detect attacks, and recover from the effect of attacks. Um, but they may introduce new vulnerabilities though, and um, also residual vulnerabilities may be there. And uh, the goal of countermeasures is to uh, minimize the residual level of uh, risk to the assets. Uh, intrusions and intrusion detection. So the intrusion is a security event or a combination of multiple security events that constitutes a security incident in which an intruder gains access. Okay? What is intrusion detection? Um, it's when a monitoring system um, provides real time warnings of um, access to system resources. And then, um, you know, another line of defense uh, in addition to authentication, access control, and firewalls. The IDS. It can identify attacks before they cause any damage, um, act as a deterrent, and um, enable cu uh, cl a collection of useful information about the attack itself. So um, an IDS, it consists of um, three types of components, sensors, analyzers, and user interface. And there are three types, I guess. Host-based IDS, which uh, monitors the characteristics of a single host. Network-based RDS, which monitors the network traffic, and a hybrid or distributed, which is just a combination of both. Which one do we think might be most effective out of those three? The one hybrid. hybrid. Yeah, probably a hybrid one, because we are single point of failure if we're just monitoring a single host. Um, what is the RDS principle? Um, well, RDS assumes a true behavior to be a different form from a legitimate user. And um, the problem is the uh, overlapping behavior. So we get things like um, false negatives and false positives. So that little intersection there is um, an example of maybe where a user is acting normally, but falls within the confides of what might be considered by the IDS to be um, um, unauthorized behavior. So it does happen. Base rate fallacy. So the IDS should be able to detect most intrusions um, and keep the false minimum alarm rate down. Um, yeah, it can be difficult to meet high detection rate and uh, low false alarm rate, but um, in general, if the actual intrusions is less than the number of uh, legitimate uses, the uh, false alarm rate would be high, and it's called the base rate fallacy. What are some of the requirements of an IDS? Run continually, to be fault tolerant, to uh, re resist subversion, impose a minimal overhead on system, and um, configured according to system security policies. It has to adapt to changes in systems and users, so we call that elasticity. 
um, scale to monitor large numbers of systems, again, scaling up, um, provide graceful degradation of a service, and uh, allow dynamic reconfiguration, okay? We call these ad hoc networks. Um, a host-based IDS, okay, adds a specialized layer of security software to vulnerable or sensitive systems. It monitors activity to detect su su suspicious behavior, and its primary purpose is to um, detect intrusions and log suspicious events and send alerts. Um, yeah, and it can detect both internal and external intrusions. Um, types of host-based IDS, anomaly-based, okay, so within the threshold of detection, it involves counting the number of occurrences of a specific, uh, specific event over an interval of time, or a profile-based, um, which is uh, the profile of the user activity, uh, like we said with our false positives, and a signature-based, which is um, tries to define a set of rules or attack patterns that can be used to do, uh, given that behavior is an intruder. If we have a poorly configured signature-based host IDS system um, that looks for anomalies, uh, we can get a, a high false uh, positive rate if it's not configured correctly, if it's not trained well. So this little graph here gives us a measure, model, and intrusion detected. Okay, so on the left we've got it. Login frequency by day, by time, and then the um, the model is at like sort of the mean standard deviation of, of that user activity, and um, what's the type of intrusion that we might be able to detect there? Well, intruders may likely be able to uh, want to log in and off hours, so um, that's sort of one behavior that we might be able to uh, model for. What else? Um, execution frequency, let's just pick another random one. We model that with a mean and standard deviation. So we detect intruders uh, use different commands uh, or successful penetration by a legitimate user who has gained access to privileged commands, which is uh, rare, but it does happen. So for every measure, there is a model and um, the type of intrusion that we do see corresponding with that. Uh, an anomaly-based RDS, okay, statistical, um, using uh, an invariate, multivariate, univariate, multivariate, or uh, time series models or observed metrics. Uh, they're knowledge-based, so it uses a expert system that classifies as uh, behavior uh, based on a set of rules. Or a machine learning, where uh, we automatically determine suitable classification models from training data. Again, that's quite a big topic, so we won't get into that. So signature-based detection, we've got things like rule-based anomaly detection, okay? Uh, historical, historical audit records are uh, analyzed to identify usage patterns. Uh, rules are generated that describe those patterns and um, current behavior is, is matched against a uh, uh, set of pre-existing rules. Um, does not uh, require knowledge of security vulnerabilities within the system, but obviously uses knowledge of attacks on previously disclosed vulnerabilities. Um, but we need a, a large database of rules, okay? And then we've got rule-based penetration identification, okay? And that works on key features, rules, and um, stuff that's specific to the machine operating system. And then a Snort and Suricata are example of rule-based IDSs. Have you guys heard of Snort or Suricata? No worries if not, just wondering. <laughs> um, Snort is the one that you probably will run into in um, your networking adventures. So a distributed HRDS, uh, host intrusion detection system, um, multi multiple nodes. Uh, it's more effective uh, by coordination and cooperation uh, among IDSs in the network and uh, one or more nodes act as uh, sensors, okay? So, as you can see, um, we can sort of observe a decentralized, um, but also centralized infrastructure here. And then we've got different modules scattered around this diagram, okay? The host agent module, uh, which is the audit collection module running in the background of a monitored system. The LAN agent module that we can see over here and uh, the central traffic uh, manager module. So again, it's, it's, it's a distributed um, layered system.
Okay. So a network-based RDS, um, this is more sort of our diametric opposite to our client-based system, okay? They monitor traffic at selected points of a network, okay? Sample points, really. Um, and this examines traffic uh, packet by packet in uh, real time, or close to real time. And um, we may examine the network, uh, transport, and uh, and all. <laughs> the application level protocol activity, okay? So what is the user actually doing on an application uh, before it works its way down the TCP stack? Uh, comprised of a number of sensors, one or more servers for the MDIS management functions and uh, one or more uh, management consoles for the human interface and uh, analysis of track patterns uh, may be done at the sensor, the uh, management server or, or combination of them. Uh, net network intrusion detection system sensor deployment. So we've got inline sensors and these are inserted into a network segment. So the traffic is monitoring must pass through the sensor. Um, you can think about this like a, um, like, a, like a bottleneck that the data has to go through. And then passive sensors are just sort of listening out, okay? This is a little bit about how a network intrusion det detection system is deployed, okay? We see we've got the internet over there and then traffic goes through the external firewall and this area could be a DMZ but it's not and then we've got our subs network which is mail, DNS, etc. Once it leaves the external firewall travels to the LAN switch and then we've got our internal firewalls over another LAN switch for our routers which could be our home network and then obviously we've got our workstation uh, computers or uh, Intel database or server. Um, how do we detect uh, threats, intrusion in um, networks? Well, uh, signature detection works. Uh, application, we, um, we can see unexpected application services and policy variations. Uh, anomaly detection also works, so uh, DOS attacks, scanning and worms. Again, all of this stuff is gonna flag as unusual network behavior. I mean, they have different um, types of traffic here. Uh, when a sensor detects a potential violation, it sends an alert and logs information to the event. So again, we're just detecting and logging. We're not actively preventing anything, okay? We're just collecting information on the event if it's suspicious. Um, some open source intrusion detection systems you guys could download. Um, Snort, you get that snort.org. Um, that's a really good one, open source. and. Uh, Suricata, which is another one. Um, I'm more fan of Snort myself, um, just because I think that it's a bit more um, it's a bit more configurable. You can download more plugins for it. It's actively worked on. Suricata is a good one as well, though. And um, Bro, which is also known as uh, Zeek, and um, this is a signature and anomaly-based one. Okay, so a distributed system. Here is a. Um, research diagram um, in open source IDSs. So we've got Suricart and Snort on here and we can see um, the amount of blacklisted IPs that have been added to these two programs. We can see there's a big drop around this point but pretty consistently um, Suricart has more. Okay, uh, Quite a few. Just, just because there are more doesn't necessarily mean that that service is superior or provides better performance. And then diversity and Suricata based on payload contents, okay? And it says number of payload content uh, file, so what it picks up essentially, okay? Moving on. Need for firewalls. We have to connect to the internet, but that in itself creates a threat. And firewalls are a pretty effective way of keeping our local network secure. Um, we insert them between the network and the internet via a controlled link. And this can be a single computer system, uh, set two or more systems working together. So 
we can set this up in a dead man's zone, we can set up it on the zone, we can do it, we can sort install them on our actual computers themselves. Um, and you've got to think of them as perimeter defense, okay? So a uh, single choke point that imposes uh, security and all thing, and it and it insulates the internal system like a blanket, right? Uh, from uh, external networks. What are some of the characteristics of a firewall? Well, we have our design goals in mind from the start. Um, we know that all traffic must pass through it. Only authorized traffic, um, based on our policy, is allowed to pass through it. So you can think of it like a border. Um, the firewall itself is immune to penetration. It's sort of the point of it, really. Um, and the techniques used by firewalls to control access and uh, enforce the uh, site security policy um, are a few of these service detection user and behavior control okay so firewall capabilities and limits um, capabilities single choke point we can monitor threats it's a convenient platform and um, it we can we can do our IPsec through it what can't it do um, cannot protect against attacks that bypass the firewall again if you somehow don't have to deal with it then if you have a pre-established connection for instance uh, may not fully protect against internal threats we never really think about that but if something's already past the firewall because it was there before it was put up that can be a, a big problem uh, improperly secured wireless local net networks can be accessed from outside the organization this happens all the time a laptop personal uh, device assistant I think that's what PDA stands for I don't know maybe, uh, maybe I'm getting that wrong or portable storage device may be infected so somebody brings in a flash drive that says you know all my passwords and that unleashes a rootkit onto a network system um, very easily hardware can introduce threats very easily can any sort of portable storage device really be quite dangerous if it's not screened properly, okay? Um, what's some of the types of firewalls? Um, well, we've looked at internal and uh, external sort of threats and, and how they interact with the general model, but we do things like using packet filtering firewalls, okay, which uses sort of um, this stack here, a stateful inspection firewall, an application firewall, or an application proxy firewall, and a circuit level proxy firewall, okay? It's basically just describing where the um, connections are going. In a packet fi filtering firewall, they just go right through the stack. The state info is given to the inspection firewall, it does the same thing as the packet filtering one, so you may as well use that. Um, an application proxy firewall, we see sort of two stacks there, um, and a proxy bridge between the two. And the circuit level proxy would be the same thing except it uses a circuit level bridge instead of an application level bridge. So packet filtering firewall. Um, it, this applies rules to incoming and outgoing IP packets. Okay, It's uh, typically a list of uh, rules based on matches in the IP or TCP header. Uh, it forwards or discards the packets based on rules match. If you notice a bad header or check some on it, throw it out. Filtering rules are based on information and contained in a network packet. So we've got things in the header packet like source IP, destination IP, um, source and destination transport level address, um, IP protocol field, and uh, the interface that's going to. And this has got two default policies, discard and forward. Okay, either get rid of it or move it forward. Okay. Packet filter rules examples. Here is an example of a matrix that would define rules for a packet filtering. We've got things that, um, so, okay. Let's take uh, rule set C. The action is allow, and the asterisk means true. For our host port, their host, and port 25. And the comment is um, an outgoing uh, connection to an external SMT port, SMTP port, okay. Does anybody know what SMTP stands for? Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And it's a um, service that we use on um, computer servers. Okay. 
packet filter advantages and weaknesses. What are some of the advantages? Well, simple, uh, it's transparent to the user, it's very fast. What are some of the weaknesses though? It cannot prevent attacks that employ application specific vulnerabilities or functions, okay? Because there's nothing malicious at that layer. If the packet itself, yes, is structured, then um, there's going to be no specific red flag. It's got limited logging functionality and um, it doesn't support advanced user authentication, okay? Oh. Right, it's vulnerable to attacks on the uh, TCIP protocol bugs and um, improper configuration can obviously lead to uh, data breaches. Here's a uh, stateful firewall example matrix, okay? We've got our source addresses on the left and then we move to our source port and then we move to a destination address, the destination port and whether or not the connection state has been established, okay? Moving on. Stateful inspection firewall this tightens the rules for TCP traffic by creating a directory of outbound TCP connections, okay? There is an entry for each established connection. Packet filter allows incoming traffic to a high number of ports only, okay? So those packets that fit the profile of one of the entries in this directory, so it remembers the states of these TCP connections. And it reviews packet information, but also information about TCP connections, okay? And that keeps tracks of um, the TCP sequence numbers uh, to prevent attacks that depend on sequence number, okay? And that inspects protocols like FTP, IM, SIP scans. Application level gateways, which are also known as application proxy, um, they act as a relay. Um, like we said, there's two stacks in there. Um, user contacts gateway using a TCIP application. If the user is authenticated, the gateway contacts the applica application on a remote host, and then it relays the TCP segments back between the user and the server, okay? So there's that, there's that layer, extra layer of security, okay? And it must have a proxy code for each application, um, and it may restrict application features supported based on the proxy rules. And they tend to be more secure than packet filters for a number of reasons, but the main disadvantage is that this has got a lot of overhead when it comes to processing, okay? And you've got to think about this whole process being conducted for each TCIP connection. It's, it's, it's going to get out of hand. A circuit level gateway, like we saw in the diagrams, sets up two TCP connections, relays TCP segments, and um, the security function consists of determining which connections will be allowed. And uh, it's typically used inside when users are trusted, okay? and it will use the application level gateway uh, inbound and circuit level gateway outbound. It's got lower overheads, generally. Host-based firewalls, we use these to secure an individual host. They're available in operating systems, but you can install them as an add-on package depending on which operating system you're using. We can filter and restrict packet flows based on host-based firewalls. Uh, the common location is usually a uh, server. And the advantages of it are that filtering rules can be tailored to the host environment. The protection is provided independent of topology and uh, it provides an additional layer of protection. Okay, A personal firewall. Where might we see a personal firewall installed? In your house. Yeah, on your home computer. Um, this controls traffic between a personal computer or workstation and the uh, uh, internet or enterprise network. We can use this both at home and corporate offices. Uh, typically, it's a software module, okay, like Windows Firewall. Um, it can be housed in a router that connects all of the home networks to a DSL. Anyone recognize DSL, DSL filter? You know what that is from phone line, splits into phone line and ethernet. Cable modem or other internet interface. Typically, it's uh, much less complex than a server-based or standalone firewall, which, um, you know, for obvious reasons, a server firewall is going to be more complex because it handle, handles more traffic, for one. Um, but the primary role is to deny unauthorized remote access to a personal computer. And, um, yeah, again, it may monitor outgoing traffic to detect uh, worms and malware activity. 
that might introduce an internal threat into a um, otherwise secure network which has a pretty good firewall. Here's um, an example of a uh, firewall on a Mac. Okay, I don't use Mac, but this is what it looks like. We can turn on or off ports and basically change rules. Um, we can stop all the incoming network communications to all services and ports. It's quite a handy button to have, isn't it? And um, we can use FTP to retrieve files apparently on this. And um, there's quite a, quite a few options on there, but that looks like a fairly old screenshot. So maybe they've changed it a bit more since then. Uh, firewall location. So like we can see, we have a dead man network, dead man zone network, and uh, demilitarized zone, not dead man. But essentially from the internet, goes through the ISP to a boundary router, first through external firewall, reaches our LAN switch, where we've got DNET, a DNS, email, web servers, and then a secondary LAN switch, which then passes through another internal firewall. And then when that gets to our LAN switch, they're pretty much at our application database servers and our workstations. Okay. Uh, a VPN, which I'm sure we've all heard of. And we can see um, exactly how uh, IPsec works here. We see our packet with its header travel to the internet um, and it goes to our other workstation back through the internet and then to the next workstation which is essentially just chaining the connection between us and somebody else okay usually it's a private server there are many uh, companies out there that offer easy to use VPNs now VPNs are really popular for a number of reasons but um, Move on. Then we've got distributed firewalls. Okay, so this is where we introduce the same firewalls we had previously, except we use boundary routers to um, externalize our dead man zone, and then uh, we add um, distributed firewalls to each network node. This is more secure, but why may this not be everything that it's cracked out to be? Slow. Yeah, there's a lot of overhead, um, unfortunately. But um, having hosted resident firewalls does introduce more security. Okay. Um, so what have been the recent addition to security products? Uh, inline network-based IDS can block traffic and um, functional addition to the firewall that adds IDS capabilities. Uh, we could block all the traffic like a firewall, okay? And notice the difference, IPS. And um, it, uh, it makes use of algorithms that are developed for an IDS, okay? And uh, it could be network or host-based. What does a host-based IPS look like? HIPS. Uh, it identifies attacks using both signature and anomaly detection signatures, okay? So the signature focuses on the specific content. And anomaly looks for patterns and it can be tailored to the specific platform. And um, can also use a sandbox approach to monitor the behavior. Okay, um, the, the advantages are quite similar to what we see in IDS, okay, is, um, well, HIDS. Um, the various application tools work closely together. Uh, threat prevention is more comprehensive and management is easier. And a network. <laughs> Based IPS. <laughs> Don't think we thought that one through. Um, inline IDS, NIDS with the authority to discard packets and uh, tear down TCP uh, connections. I think those are supposed to be on the same bullet point. But it uses uh, signature and anomaly detection. Um, it may provide flow data protection. And um, you know what we might see here is uh, monitoring for application flow content. Okay, so even application suspicious net network application layer behavior might be um, identified, okay? We can identify malicious packets using things like pattern matching, things called stateful matching. Remember stateful from the diagram where it's just one above the pack packet filtering. Um, protocol anomaly, so um, you know, hey, why is there FTP? This network doesn't allow FTP. 
Ding, ding, ding. Traffic anomaly. Why are there 10,000 packets coming from this IP address when it only usually transmits 5,000, you know? The traffic inconsistency based on the pattern or behavior. And statistical anomaly, okay? Moving on. Snort in line. So, um, snort. Um, it's not in line, enable snort to function as an intrusion prevention capability. Okay, so snort primarily is an IDS, meaning it detects the threat, but snort can also be installed to snort in line as a prevention system. Um, it includes a replace option, so instead of a listen option, it includes a replace option, which allows the snort user to modify packets rather than just drop them. Okay, um, this is really useful if you want to do a honeypot implementation or do a honeypot attack, it's essentially um, bait. You know, you put a intentionally insecure server on your network to see who will go after it. And then whoever uh, successfully um, finds their way into the server, we feed them fake data to allow them to think that they've got an access to it. And really, we're using Snort to monitor the whole thing. So. Um, there's more on that, but I'll wait until you guys get a few levels up. Um, so drop, snort rejects a packet based on the options to find the rule and logs. Uh, the result, we reject it, the packet is rejected, and the result is logged and an error message is returned. But um, S drop would be an example where we reject a packet, but we don't lock it. Okay. Unified threat management products. We're sort of seeing a logging in uh, reporting modules guts here. Um, the raw incoming traffic goes through a routing module, a VPN module, firewall module, and then um, in the data analysis engine, we run it through antivirus, we use heuristics, um, detect for anomalies, go through your IDS system, the IPS engine, the activity inspection engine, which might look at the application um, layer activity instead of just the network uh, 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 protocol um, and then the web photo module the end spam module again through the VPN module and then through the bandwidth shaping module and then out comes our clean control traffic okay so that's one threat management product which is actually when you think about that's quite a comprehensive way to fill your traffic so types of vulnerability well most of the time it's a flaw in software and flaw is very broad a flaw could be anything really um, weaknesses in how protocols and software are implemented. You know, um, if the implementation isn't done correctly, there are weaknesses that can occur. And uh, weaknesses in system and network configuration, okay? Because usually the technology isn't at fault, it's the setup that really brings it in. Okay. Attack vulnerability intrusion error failure module. Okay, this is a lot of words, but um, the hacker goes for his attack, exploits the vulnerability, and um, goes through the detection, finds an error, and then fails, okay? Um, and then you can find that diagram online. Um, but this is what the failure module mo uh, model looks like, which I'm pretty sure we all know how that process works anyway. Uh, CVE, which is something you might have heard of quite frequently in cybersecurity, um, it's called the Common Vulnerability and Exposures. Um, a dictionary of common names, CVE identifies. If you do pen testing, you'll be read about this stuff every 24 minutes. Um, publicly known cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Um, so again, you'd be surprised how many CVEs exists that are capable of being exploited because they haven't been patched. And a standardized description for each vulnerability or exposure. Thankfully, on like our college systems, we don't have any CVEs because we usually keep things um, pretty tip-top and updated. Um, recognizing critically, okay, here's just the level of um, uh, level of security that we can sort of classify our critical threats. One non-sensitive information being disclosed and five being you know remote exploitation through things like FTP which I've done before 
Um, CVSS, okay, so two, in 1999, six years later, they come out with the scoring system. Provides common lang language for scoring IT vulnerabilities and an open framework for communicating other characteristics and impacts. Uh, it's relevant to IT managers, vulnerability bulletin providers, security and application vendors, and uh, uh, researchers. And it's, it's very useful because it can be used to um, assess the severity of uh, discovered vulnerabilities and prioritize relations. So we can take our most dangerous threats and put them at the top of the CVSS and deal with those th first. And then the ones that aren't as, um, as, as uh, prominent, we can sort of deal with those last. What is the um, severity over time? Again, this is up to 2019, but um, as you can see, we sort of see sort of an upwards trend peaking around 2018. <sighs> but usually we see more highs than lows, and we see more medium range than high or low together. But I assume the data is still being collected on 2019. Okay. Vulnerability exploit going after easy targets um, because there are a small number of um, services that only have to be insecure um, and attackers are very opportunistic. They take the easiest and most convenient route and exploit the best known flaws in the most effective way with the most widely available attack tools. That is 100% true. That is exactly what hackers do because it is... Um, you know, you're not going to make it more work for yourself. Why find a complex solution to a problem? Like, I could just walk over to that door and open it instead of, you know, getting that webcam, twirling it around and pulling the door. You know, I'm going to take the most simple route with the best known route um, with the best known tools. So when you think about it, when you think it through, it makes sense. Um, what's the vulnerability life cycle? Um, well, we have different stages, okay? Um, when the application is created, when a vulnerability is discovered, when we learn to exploit that vulnerability, then the vulnerability gets disclosed and then it becomes public. Immediately, we usually see a patch roll out and then the patch is installed. So we have sort of our pre-disclosure um, risk, post-disclosure risk, and post-patch risk, which is between when the patch is available and the patch is installed. If you've got a um, vulnerability in your system and it hasn't been patched, this post-patch risk is something that vendors have to deal with quite a bit in industry. Um, here's a little bit about a high-profile vulnerability exploitation, Talk Talk, uh, hacked on the 22nd of October 2015. 1.2 million customer email addresses were leaked. Um, 21k bank account numbers and sort codes um, and the uh, <laughs> blind SQL injection was launched against the company website allegedly done for shits and giggles um, which I think is quite a funny reason to leak all that customer information um, it's a well known type of vulnerability older than the hackers responsible for the attack because S SQL has been around a lot longer than these um, <laughs> The, the hackers probably well they're probably quite young um, but this had a dramatic impact on their stock price because this is listed on the stock market and it fell 12% um, in one day and um, that lost the company about 360 million so really when you think about how serious these vulnerability, vulnerability exploitations are something very a very small blind SQL injection attack which is essentially like saying there's a spot on this wall in front of me and if I hit it enough I'll hit the weak spot right that's essentially a good metaphor describing how an SQL blind SQL injection attack works anyway a regular SQL injection is a more focused query but we won't get into that today you right oh sorry I thought you were putting your hand up yeah um, what's the life cycle of a security vulnerability um, so uh, the reality is that um, the number of intrusions have gone up 
but oh, it's kind of a it's a histogram, so it's kind of hard to read. But um, yeah, let's move on from that. Um, a zero day vulnerability. I'm sure we've all heard of this. Um, it refers to a hole in software that's unknown to the vendor. Um, but um, it's known to hackers before the vendor becomes aware, okay? Um, that's how they um, got to the, uh, that's how Stuxnet got into the Iranian enrichment program. Uh, it's a flaw that leaves software defenseless uh, against an attacker that occurs on the very same day the vulnerability is discovered, such as called a zero day exploit, meaning there are zero days between the time the vulnerability is discovered and the first attack. Uh, previously unknown security vulnerabilities where there are currently no protections in place. Usually people sell these on the black market for a lot of money. Um, the vulnerability management process, okay. We identify assets, we prioritize those assets, we identify where those assets might be insecure, we prioritize and then fix those securities, and then we verify that the vulnerability no longer exists. It's a pretty good model for uh, security management. So when we're managing vulnerabilities, we can use some scanning tools and we can analyze the systems and software configurations for known vulnerabilities. Um, they're useful for administrators. They can help us identify known vulnerabilities in their system in a legitimate way. And um, unfortunately though, they can be used by hackers to identify the vulnerabilities in target system and exploit it. So think Nmap, Metasploit, um, and the administrators must do this first, because if they don't, well, you know, um, it's 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 um, becomes a, a exploited um, uh, flaw. Uh, vendors um, in automation usually automate the process of these fixes. So, um, for example, several several uh, generations of Windows have now incorporated automatic updates. Prior to that. Windows manually visited uh, their Windows update site. Um, the system can be configured for uh, several levels of autonomy. Okay, notify when updates are available and uh, download automatically and notify when ready to install. Okay. And downloads and automatically installs at scheduled time. Uh, it's only related to Microsoft's own products. So Windows 10 automatic updates, I'm sure we're all familiar, but by default, it's on automatic, which is the recommended option. Any questions? Cool. No problem. All right, and there's a bit of further reading on that. That's it. Cool. Now there's a um, task sheet in uh, the email I sent. So.